Well, good evening, everybody. As our numbers uh, continue to increase, it's ever so exciting, but it's a little bit after five and we should uh, get started with this evening's uh, Humanity in Healthcare series. Uh, we're delighted to have you join us. And with the assistance of my trustee, Terry, he's gonna move the slide forward as I go through these and share a little bit about uh, what we hope to create here this evening is a, is a space so we can have these kinds of important conversations that really its intent is to help highlight our collective humanity. Because what we really want to do is to be able to promote professional development that really ha that helps to prioritize the health of our, of our healthcare teams and those that we work with, um, but also to take an opportunity to reflect and to think about the, the, the ways that we care for and with one another. And as we do that, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the land and the territory that we're on, on our next slide. And then this gives us an opportunity to begin to acknowledge and to, to be aware that Queen is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. And we're ever so grateful to be able to live, to learn, and to play uh, on this land. I think it's really important, or I know it's really important, that uh, we share any disclosures that we have from the people that are on our team. And I, people can read these things, um, but the committee is comprised, um, and there's a few more names that are not there, so I won't go through everybody, but I just want to know that there are a few other people. But Catherine Donnelly, uh, Damon Dagnoni, Shana Watson, and myself, Ernest Elwell Clark, and we're, we're so delighted that you could join us this evening. We also wanna share with you our disclosure of uh, commercial support, which is simply to say uh, on the next slide that um, we haven't received uh, any in-kind support uh, from any organizations to work with you this evening. So at present, we're volunteers who care about an issue that, would, um, that we wanna be able to talk about with everybody. And so when we move forward to the next slide, and then the one after that, because Erin is ahead of herself. Um, we just, we want also in, in full disclosure, want to talk about how this program mitigates any potential bias. Um, the fact that, you know, all programs need and should begin with a needs assessment, that the names that I've identified are all made up of various types of members um, from healthcare community, both from healthcare providers and from consumers themselves that we didn't have any industry personnel working with us as part of this planning committee, that presenters are also required uh, to disclose any or all personal relationship with industry, and that we were really interested in your feedback. We want you to tell us if you feel the biased information is being presented, or better yet, um, come talk to the planning committee and think about the ways that we can work together or join us um, for being moving forward. At the end of our presentation this evening, and you'll see this demonstrated on our next slide, I'm imagining most of you in this world <laughs> are really familiar with Zoom and how to talk with one another. But if you use that chat function at the bottom of your screen, that's gonna help you to put up your thoughts and comments. And I'm gonna welcome you to do that um, as we go through our presentation and as we end with our, our discussion. But what's gonna make it so intriguing to get through all of our discussion tonight, and you'll see on our next slide, is that I have the pleasure this evening of welcoming Dr. Jane Philpot to join us. Jane is uh, the Dean of our Faculty of Health Sciences and the Director of the School of Medicine um, and the Chief Executive Officer of SEMO. As most of you probably know, uh, Jane joined the Faculty of Health Sciences here at Queens in July, um, a brave woman, that has come in a pandemic uh, to take over a deanship and uh, blessed us with the fortune of having an opportunity um, of moving together in, in this time and learning again from and with one another. Tonight, uh, Jane's talk is with respect to navigating the detours in career and in life. And it is with pleasure uh, that I welcome Jane uh, in her joining with us, and I look forward to our conversation afterwards, and I'll turn it over to Jane. Thanks very much, Erna, for that lovely introduction, and I want to thank the entire planning committee for uh, inviting me to do this talk, and particularly to uh, Dr. Damon Dagnoni, who uh, was the inspiration behind the particular theme that I chose for the talk tonight, based on a, a conversation uh, 
at a distance uh, on a picnic table. <laughs> and uh, we talked a little bit about detours in, the, in that conversation and that uh, led to this uh, presentation tonight. So congratulations to the committee on putting this series together, which I think is an important one. And I hope that you'll find tonight's talk helpful. I really look forward to your comments and feedback uh, of any kind. And uh, I'll talk for probably about 20 minutes with a prepared uh, talk and then uh, we'll we'll open it up for some questions and comments afterward. So with that I wanted to to talk about the fact that this year of, of 2020 has taken all of us on on a giant detour. Uh, we're we're all far from where we expected to be this year uh, and it's not the journey that any of us wanted to take. But uh, like many of, of life's harshest realities, uh, the, re the arrival of this pandemic was beyond our control. And uh, I would say that if I've learned anything in, in the uh, s now more than six years, the six decades that I've spent on this planet, uh, it's that we need to be prepared for detours on our journey through life. And whether we're talking about your personal life or your professional life, no matter how well you plan or how, how meticulously you've packed for the journey or how clear your vision of the destination, it's a rare voyage that doesn't involve uh, or encounter some kind of an unexpected roadblock or a surprise and sometimes even tragedy. I've had to take a few detours myself. Uh, the ones that I'm going to talk about tonight are ones that I would never wish on anyone. But in retrospect, they were the times that I learned the most about myself and how I should spend the days that I have on the planet. And I've learned some clues uh, as I took those detours unexpectedly about how to get back on a good path. And perhaps more importantly, I've gathered some appreciation of the fact that even the detours of life are not distributed fairly. So what I'm going to do is walk you through the stories of two of the biggest walls that I've ever crashed into and describe how I found my way back to a path where I could move forward again. The first of these stories happened half a lifetime ago but I remember every moment of it as if it happened yesterday. So the scene that I wanna take you to is a scene in rural Niger, West Africa. My husband and I had moved there to work at a mission hospital uh, located about 500 kilometers east of the capital city of Niger. Uh, I was working as a doctor in the medical outpatient department of the hospital and my husband was a hospital director. And after about 18 months in the country, we decided to move for a few months with our two daughters, another 200 kilometers further east, where we wanted to spend a few months focused on intensive study of the Hausa language. Uh, some of you may be a little bit familiar with Niger. It's one of the most economically impoverished countries in the world. Um, but it was our home and we were very happy, happy there. We were settling in, making friends, learning the Hausa language and history and culture. And one Monday morning, our daughter, Emily, uh, who was two and a half years old, woke up with vomiting. It was the first thing we heard. And when I went to see her, I realized she also had a fever. And my first instinct was that she probably had malaria, uh, which was very common. And uh, we were using malaria prophylaxis, but uh, it doesn't always work. And so we drove to a local clinic to get her tested and found out that her malaria smear was negative and her white blood count was normal. So uh, we relaxed a little bit. But a couple of hours later, the diagnosis became clear. She started to develop a horrible purple rash. And for those of you who have ever seen the rash, it's pathognomonic for something called meningococcemia, a rapidly fatal bacterial infection caused by Neisseria meningitides. And I knew as soon as I saw that rash, uh, my heart sunk. I knew she was very seriously ill and that we had to get her to a hospital immediately so she could be given intravenous penicillin. So we put our two daughters our two and a half year old and our baby in the back of our Mitsubishi Lancer and we put pedal to the metal and we raced as fast as the car would go the 200 kilometers back to the mission hospital. 
as we drove, our eight-month-old daughter, Bethany, began to develop the very same frightening purple rash, and I realized that she too was infected. And a little while after that, when we were still only halfway to the hospital, our beautiful little Emily had a seizure and she died uh, immediately. It was, as you can imagine, the very worst day of my life. We arrived at the hospital. Uh, we were greeted by shocked friends and colleagues. You remember these are in the days where no one can phone ahead or send a message. But our colleagues sprang into action immediately. They realized how sick Bethany was. And the doctors quickly turned a storage room into an ICU. They started Bethany on penicillin. They inserted a central line to monitor her fluid levels. And they told us that she would probably not survive the night. So my first instinct was that I wanted to leave that country and never go back. I had hit a wall of shock and grief and I could not imagine a way forward for our life in Niger. The following morning, Emily was buried in a small wooden box that was made for her by the hospital carpenter. We watched as that box was lowered into a freshly dug grave on the rocky soil on the edge of the village. Meanwhile, our daughter Bethany was fighting for her life in the hospital and we were praying that we wouldn't be burying our second daughter the next day. But that morning, it was our Nigerian friends and colleagues who gave us the first hints of how we would find a path around our pain. It was just before the funeral service and burial when they came to greet us. And I'll never forget, there was a very long line of mourners, um, probably more than a hundred who came to see us and they waited patiently to greet us quietly and reverently. But the words they spoke surprised me. They went to my husband, Gaiswa Magida. Then they came to me, a guy shaky Wargida. And then they said, Yi Hankuri, Se Hankuri. And the translation of that is, be patient. There is nothing for you but patience. And I remember thinking, be patient? My beautiful, innocent daughter has died and I'm supposed to be patient? I didn't understand the message that day and perhaps I still don't fully understand it now. But it started me thinking about what I could learn from our patient, stoical friends about coping with grief. You see, at that time in Niger, about 27% of babies would not live to see their fifth birthday. And in the years to come, as I was conducting village health surveys in rural Niger, I understood more about what this meant because there was not a family that I found who hadn't lost a child close to them. And it was not unusual for our parents to bury two or even three of their children. And in most cases, those children died of preventable and treatable conditions, diarrhea, respiratory infections, measles, malaria, and malnutrition. So our loss was devastating, but we were not special. We were simply getting a small taste of the profound inequities that exist on this planet, where some endure conditions of deep-rooted poverty, hunger, and lack of access to health care. And others, like me, are born to a protective privilege and an unspoken assumption that we will somehow be shielded from grief. So it was perspective that enabled me to get on with my life, a firm, fierce perspective that the world is a very unfair place, but that I had actually often the benefits of those inequities. I might have already known that in my head, but now I felt it in my heart. My response to the injustices of the world would be that I wanted to commit the rest of my life to trying to make the world a bit more fair. You see, in 1991, when our daughter died, more than 12 million children in the world died before they reached the age of five. 
And I wanted to spend the rest of my days working toward a world where that is not the expectation and where toddlers don't die in such numbers from preventable and treatable infections. It was perspective that helped me to navigate this very unexpected detour in how we thought our life would unfold. So let me now navigate fast forward to a very different story. In this case, it was not a personal tragedy, but more of a professional crisis. It's one that's fresher and one from which I have not so fulsomely analyzed the lessons learned. My professional crisis happened in the year 2019, and it's a very long story. So I'm just going to cover a few highlights here. Uh, after working for more than 30 years as a family doctor, I decided to run for a seat in the House of Commons. I believe that politics was a potent mechanism to advance the kind of systemic policy-based changes that are necessary to improve health at a population level. And I was very happy to be elected in 2015 and fortunate to be granted a seat at the cabinet table. I found it to be a wonderful way to improve lives via health policy changes, and I hoped that I would be able to continue in that path for as long as possible. Now you make a lot of compromises in politics and in the name of cabinet solidarity, you learn that you have to give in on a few policy decisions that don't align with your preferred option. But early in 2019, an issue emerged on which I could not line up with the government. So I had to voice my objections which I did first privately. And then when that didn't work, I had to make my views public. And the obligation, because they were not in line with the government, was that I was obliged to resign from cabinet. It had to do with attempted political interference in the largest corporate criminal trial of Canadian history. So legal matters were not directly in my portfolio, but I knew that our entire democracy is founded on the principle that there should never be political interference in matters pertaining to the law, including pr criminal prosecutions. And I felt that I could not remain silent while that, that principle was at risk of being violated. My resignation from cabinet was triggered uh, largely by this inability to maintain solidarity with the government's approach uh, based on the principle of upholding the independence of the judicial branch of government. But an underlying uh, and related rationale for my resignation was that I believed I couldn't be a silent bystander while Canada's first Indigenous Attorney General was the victim of an assault on her character while she was simply conducting her duty with intelligence and integrity. And so long story short, uh, after resigning from cabinet, I was expelled from my former political party and I suddenly found myself sitting as an independent member of parliament. My political path had suddenly taken a very serious detour and I wondered how I would ever find my way back did I even want to continue? And should I give up or should I run again? So here's where there's an example of the second key that I've discovered in managing detours. It's one that's perhaps obvious to you, but it's perseverance. There was a big part of me that wanted to give up. Politics is a highly toxic work environment. And every day on social media, I was receiving partisan attacks. Some were simply people telling me to go away and be quiet, and some actually went as far as people wishing I were dead. But it was a simple encounter in a grocery store that helped me figure out what I had to do. It was the spring of 2019, and I was at the Longos in Stouffville with our youngest daughter, Lydia. And like many other days that spring, as we went about town, Complete strangers or good friends would stop and thank me for speaking up. And I'll never forget this day, we were in the frozen food section of the store and a woman stopped her cart right in front of us and told me her story. She said that she had a 15 year old daughter and the two of them had put my picture on their fridge. And she said, I wanna thank you for showing my daughter how to speak up with courage, how not to be a silent bystander even if you don't know how things are going to turn out, even if people make false accusations against you, even if you lose your job 
or your friends who were not really friends. Her take home message for me was that mock Latin cliche, illegitimi non carborundum, which usually translated means don't let the bastards grind you down. That was exactly what I needed to hear. I would run again. I would run as an independent candidate. I would run for all the teenage girls who had watched my story and found strength in it. I would show them that you don't give up and I would persevere. So I did. We ran a wonderful positive campaign with over 400 happy volunteers. We knocked on every door in our riding, talking about how we would color outside the party lines. And in the end, over 13,000 people in my riding did something that they had probably never done before. Excuse me. They voted for an independent candidate, but that was not nearly enough votes to win. And so on election night, I was devastated. I cried almost nonstop for three days, finally releasing the sadness that had been pent up in me for months. The sadness of a political journey ended. Nevertheless, I somehow persevered. And to the extent that things were within my own control, I knew that I had not given up. Now, many will argue that such a detour in my professional journey was completely self-inflicted. And maybe that's one of the lessons. I could have kept my head down. I could have not spoken up when I believed something was wrong. I could have stayed on that political path. But for me, in this case, compromise was not an option. The day that I resigned from cabinet, I wrote, there can be a cost to acting on one's principles, but there is a bigger cost to abandoning them. I chose to take a detour. And despite the price, sometimes taking a detour is the right thing to do. But now, if I can turn to my last clue about how people survive detours, and I hope that this is uh, potentially the most interesting you see, every journey can have its detours, and I found I could get around them using the tools of perspective and perseverance. But it's imperative to remember that sometimes effectively navigating a detour is actually a form of privilege. And that was definitely the case for me in finding my current path forward. Because you see, early in 2020, I landed the best job I could have ever dreamed for. I was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University. And I now get to do interesting, meaningful work in a positive environment with kind and thoughtful people who want to make the world healthier and fairer. And I would not have this job were it not for a lengthy series of opportunities in my life, having a medical degree, having a senior academic rank, having name recognition, but each of those merits were achieved only because of a long list of unearned advantages. Now, please don't get me wrong. I am thrilled to have this position. I also know that with enormous privilege comes enormous responsibility to use those advantages to take on the entrenched systems of injustice and the inequities that are all around us. But I bring up this topic of privilege because you can't talk about surviving detours without acknowledging that there's not actually a level playing field in who is able to persevere. In the case of our personal crisis in Niger, we had the benefit of being surrounded by people who loved and cared for us. We also, of course, had the immense good fortune that we were able to get intensive treatment for our baby daughter, Bethany. And we were able to get on a plane and have a medical evacuation so that she would survive. And in the case of my career change in 2019, when I spoke up causing my political trajectory to come to an abrupt dramatic halt, I was in the exceptional situation of knowing that I would not be without a job. I always had medicine as a backup opportunity. So maybe I wasn't risking that much after all. I was not forced to choose between hunger and silence. And I sometimes wonder how many people can't speak up in their workplace because doing so would mean the potential loss of a job with no obvious replacement. Excuse me for a second. I understand that it does not fall to me to judge the journey of others, 
nor to take pride that I managed to get back on my feet when I've been knocked down. But it does fall to me to acknowledge uh, my unearned advantages and take responsibility to change to the extent that I can society's patterns of injustice so that everyone can travel the journey of life uh, in a way that allows each person's unique talents and dreams to be fulfilled. You see, every voyage can encounter detours and often you can get around them with perspective and perseverance. But getting around the detours and finding the way forward is often derived from privilege, much of which is unearned advantage, like the color of one's skin or the country of one's birth. That must be acknowledged lest we fall into the trap of boasting or judgment or lest we fail to see our obligation to take down the barriers that block the path to equity for others. So if you've hit a wall or if you do in the future, I hope you'll be able to use the tools of perspective and perseverance to the extent that you can and follow the detours until you're on a forward path again. At the same time, I hope we'll all look around at our friends and neighbors and colleagues and think about who's in a tough place to see who's struggling to negotiate the detours that are standing in the way of achieving their aspirations or allowing them to pursue their vocation. And let's take down the roadblocks for others that we can. Let's take a hand and help others to get back on a good path. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Philpott, for this moving and very personal talk. Before uh, we at Queen's knew you uh, as our dean and were able to claim you as ours, uh, we knew you uh, as, a, as a public figure in your political life. And tonight, uh, I think we all feel a, a, a great deal of gratitude, certainly I do, for uh, the way in which you've allowed us to know you as a as a person, and and I I feel like your vulnerability sets an example for all of us, and invites all of us to bring ourselves to the work that we do, and uh, bring our perspective and perseverance uh, as as we work together to to make things better for other people. Uh, I know that. Uh, lots of, of people who are with us tonight will have a desire to, to share their own um, questions with you or um, their, their own thoughts on your talk tonight. So I'll invite people to put those in the, in the chat and, and we will help moderate those questions, questions to you. But thank you so much um, for trusting us with your vulnerability. Well, thank you. I, um, I told Erna that I wasn't going to that she didn't need Kleenexes, but turns out I, I was the one who needed them. <laughs> so thank you for letting me share. And I, I hope, I think your series is um, hopefully a way for all of us to explore issues that we don't as health professionals talk about um, as much as we probably should, because we're all uh, fragile human beings. And um, the more that we share who we are, hopefully uh, the stronger we'll all be together and realize uh, that we need to depend on one another. So, um, Thanks for, uh, thanks for making me feel safe. Okay, Jane, there's um, a whole bunch. I don't know if you have your chat open or not. So there's a, not that I'm expecting you to because that's what we're here for, but there's a, a variety of thank yous in forms that are coming up. So maybe Terry will keep some of those for us so that you can go back and have a read of them. But um, Perspective and perseverance, that's uh, two pretty powerful words. Um, and when I think about moving forward through challenges, it's, um, you know, sometimes we lose sight that our privilege is the reason why we're able to move forward. And that was a, a beautiful reminder this evening that um, for many of us, some of us, that that privilege is the piece that takes it um, to the next step. So thanks for reminding that. Well, you're welcome. It was, um, I mean, I, I don't know whether I fully actually analyzed how I feel about the detours and I actually welcome your feedback as to whether I've even got the right metaphor. I mean, Damon and I started this conversation talking about detours um, and I, I wasn't quite sure whether it's actually detours I'm talking about or like 
those moments when you just feel like you hit, hit a wall or um, whether they are hurdles. So it, anyone who has a better metaphor, please <laughs> let me know. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, perspective and perseverance maybe aren't the, that profound as tools to help you get around things in life. But, uh, you know, and, and, you know, maybe if I were doing it again, I would emphasize that what I really learned in this exercise was, um, I, you know, we really don't know what somebody else is going through. And while those things helped me get through, and I'm glad that they did, um, not everybody has that opportunity. I definitely saw that, you know, in the getting through the political career that um, lots of people don't have any other option. And I, I be still believe to this day that people don't speak up because they feel sometimes like they're, mm -hmm. there's no other option available to them. So people so yeah, we, we can have a later discussion about whether the word is detour or not, but I, cause, but I'm going to jump to a question in the chat and I'll do, I'll start with the first one and then my colleagues can join in with the others, but Colleen Davidson thanks you, but then she wonders if you could reflect on gender and the role and place of gender in response to barriers. Do, do women and men have different perspectives? or approaches available to them? Do you think gender plays a role in your, do you think gender played a role in your path? Hmm, wow. Um, I haven't actually uh, thought specifically about that from a gendered perspective. I think there are so many nuances and differences in our personalities that go beyond gender that it's kind of hard to, to necessarily compare. Um, you know, I think there are stereotypes around um, you know, the man that will just tough it out and, you know, push through the woman who will, you know, flounder more, um, neither of which are particularly healthy responses, but I, you know, those, those stereotypes abound, but I, my sense is that, that those are not fair generalizations, um, that, you know, men can, can, can find detours obviously just as hard, um, and, and struggle in the same way to, to, get the perspective that's necessary or the perseverance. There's a, thank you. There's a question from Rosemary Wilson who says, what has been your biggest challenge in moving into the detour that is your current role? Um, I mean, I, most of the detour, I guess I thought of in terms of, you know, the political detour that I took and I kind of feel in a way like this is, you know, I'm back on track to what I really wanted to be doing. So I feel like my, you know, this is not where I expected to be two years ago. Um, but uh, what's been most challenging around this, I think some of it has to do with, um, uh, you know, this is not the space where I've I haven't been my whole life preparing to become a dean of a medical school and haven't sort of um, uh, worked through the ranks as it were. Uh, and so sometimes like all of us, we feel like if we, um, got into a position a little bit unexpectedly, you know, do I really deserve to be here? Will people, will other people think that I deserve to be here? You know, am I going to have to somehow prove myself, um, to make people think that the principal didn't make a mistake and <laughs> we chose to be the dean? Um, I don't think that's a huge, I don't see that as a huge obstacle, mostly because all of you have been so supportive that I feel like I've had enough affirmation that people think that this, this is uh, an unusual choice for a Dean, but, but, you know, hopefully not a terrible one. Um, and because I feel like I came on board at a time when there's a real appetite for moving ahead on things that I've had some experience with and that maybe my skill set, while it mightn't have been the one somebody would have looked for at another time and place, but that at this particular time and place in Queen's history and in the faculty's history, that it kind of makes sense to have a bit of an atypical um, background. Damon? Oh, I'm not, I'm not moderating. <laughs> um, uh, Jane, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, when we when we chatted a few months back um, and spent uh, a brief time together, this this is exactly what I was uh, hoping for. I, I never um, 
I had I had not anticipated uh, uh, all that you said. I, I don't think any of us could have, but it, it definitely um, uh, is something that has uh, struck me since your arrival. Is your 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 for want of a better word, comfort with uh, demonstrating vulnerability, which uh, in the leader of our Faculty of Health Sciences uh, and also in your very public support uh, of uh, Jody Wilson Raybould, who was minister previously, it, you know, it's quite remarkable. We, we got to see exactly who you were uh, or are a part at least uh, that uh, uh, you know uh, is quite remarkable. Um, so I wanted, wanted to say that you you did a job interview as federal health minister um, in front of the whole nation, uh, which involved vulnerability and and uh, sticking to your principles, which um, is quite remarkable. Uh, and and uh, you know. Uh, you have the equivalent of your picture on our fridge here at home too. We've talked about you much with our teenage daughter or tween daughter. Um, one, one last thing I wanted to sort of comment on is, um, is the, the thought of, you know, your own resilience of spirit. I, you know, you're very humble and, and, and it's important to speak of privilege, but um, I think part of what makes you remarkable is is your resilience of your own spirit of wanting to move forward, finding meaning, having impact. Uh, and uh, my wife Trisha, who's not behind the camera but around listen, listening to all this, uh, wanted me to put that forward um, as a as a uh, you know from one set of bereaved parents to another, it, 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 um, it doesn't go unnoticed um, how hard that is to try and be resilient and move forward and talk about detours in the positive. So, so thank you so, so much for, um, for your talk tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Damon. All right, Jane, I fear the questions are lining up. And I don't want to miss out on these people who are asking things. So I'm going to jump to one from Natalie Montgomery, who thanks you uh, and shares that your words are very inspirational uh, to her personally as a recent PhD in population health and a candidate of a record in a recent Ottawa by-election. She says that we need more people that understand health and inequities in public office. And I only wish we had you right now. Natalie, sorry, you can't have her. So um, she's with us. However, she wants, she says that speaking truth to power isn't easy for free thinking academics and asks, how can we keep inspiring scientists to pursue public office so, so that we can get to better solutions to a post pandemic country? Great question. It is a great question. And I think we should have another whole conversation about this sometime because it's, it's a really interesting topic. Um, uh, I think that there's a whole lot of space in the political world for more scientists and more uh, clinicians. I think that um, scientists and, and health professionals come to politics with skill sets that are uh, really, really transferable um, and that you don't actually see a lot of. I mean, I've thought a lot during this pandemic about the kinds of things that we learn to do as health professionals around listening well, using the, all the available objective data, making a diagnosis, developing a plan, managing uncertainty, um, adapting our plan once more information becomes available. That's just what we do every single day, right? Um, and a lot of people don't come with that kind of professional background into politics. And that's why when a pandemic hits, they sort of don't know how to deal with the uncertainty behind them. Anyway, that's all to say, um, I, another time we should definitely talk more about how um, uh, clinicians and, and uh, scientists can, can become increasingly engaged uh, in, the, in the political world. It's, uh, it's a great space to be able to have an impact. Thank you. 
The next question is from Dave Messenger, and he asks about uh, you reinventing yourself professionally, sometimes uh, unasked for, I guess. And his question is if you could reflect on um, what motivated your intentional reinventions. So his example is leaving clinical practice. Um, thanks, Dave. And yeah, these are, there's so many great comments over there. I do hope that Terry or someone will grab them for me so I can read them all at uh, and the ones that we don't get to, but that's a, a great question, Dave. Um, and, and maybe it makes me realize I need to go back and kind of reanalyze that. But the, the short version of the story is in terms of leaving clinical practice to go into politics was um, I feel like over time, I've gradually had a stronger sense of, you know, why I went into medicine in the first place. And that's about trying to help people live healthier lives. And that, yes, you can do that through medicine or nursing or rehabilitation therapy, but there are so many other ways that you can do it. And while I love the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, uh, interactions uh, in the clinical world that I really started to get interested in this idea of how you can translate uh, that to a, a population level. And so it was, I've told other people this story, I'll give you a real quick version of it. But I, in fact, I think I told your department, Dave, this whole thing about uh, Paul Martin saying to me that, you know, if you can get elected and you can, you can um, ever get to the cabinet table, that you can make decisions there in a few minutes that will kind of be um, as effective or more effective than years and years of advocacy work. And honestly, it was like a light bulb went off. I was like, yes, I want that. I want to be able to make decisions that are going to, all those things that frustrate us every single day. And you think like, why doesn't somebody in the government understand this? If only they didn't have this crazy rule, things would be so much better. And when I, you know, my, my, children might accuse me of a thirst for power, but I like to think that it was a thirst for actually when you can get access to the levers. And I often used to say this about politics, that it was not, you know, getting that seat in the House of Commons was not the, the end point. It was a tool. I wanted it because I needed a, a tool that I could use to actually change some of those levers of how society is set up at a structural level. So um, that was kind of the mindset that went behind that particular transition in my life. Um, and uh, I, I, I definitely don't regret it, despite all of the other nasty, awful things that happened <laughs> uh, toward the end of my political time. Um, I, I absolutely don't regret it. You know, it's the ever famous Erna, unmute yourself. Uh, so Jane, are you uh, ready to keep going? Because there's- sure, People aren't getting tired. I mean, they, you must- oh, I, I, I saw a reference to somebody getting themselves a glass of wine, which I, you know, hardly endorse. Um, <laughs> well, so, I regret that we didn't have that delivered to your uh, work. Well, I'm, I'm still at work, so. I know, got to, guess me too. <laughs> However, Laura McEwen has asked a question. Please thank you for sharing your experience and she'd love to hear what you feel is the most critical next step for us in leveling the playing field. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I see it happening all around us. I, I feel like the conversations that I've been listening in on or part of since I've come here have been all around leveling the playing field. I think there's just this real awakening society wide. And I feel like Queens is really in a good place in that way around, you know, the places where we have access to the levers are around health professions education. And while it's not necessarily universal, I think there's a, a determined um, collective desire to say, how can we make sure that what what we're doing is accessible to everybody. So, you know, all the work that's happening around building diversity in, in uh, those who are trained as health professionals, but way more than just diversity, it's inclusion uh, in a fulsome way uh, and, and equity. And so um, I think I might've lost track of where the question started, but what, you know, I think let's, let's do what we're already doing and level the playing field here, right? 
And that can be a hard conversation because people think, well, it is level, right? There's a whole admissions process. And, you know, isn't that, isn't that a fair? Well, we're now starting to learn together that actually maybe it isn't fair because, you know, not everybody can write the admissions test and not, but not everybody can actually even get from, from high school to, to, uh, you know, their, their first opportunity to come to university. Uh, so let's kind of look back into how, what is the playing field like that sets the stage for who gets to be a nurse or a doctor or a, a researcher or, or a, an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist? Um, and how do we make sure that, that it's actually uh, fair to all? That's why we have our EDI action table and have our group on EDI and admission. So mm -hmm. that we can look at that part of leveling and the rest that there are, that's right. I think Catherine Donnelly has a question next. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in here because I just see a question from Debbie Dougherty, and it's uh, Debbie's worked with the Faculty of Health Sciences over a number of years as a community volunteer, and her focus has been on a passionate uh, advocate for interprofessional education. And she has a question here that's dear to my heart as well, and just asking if you have any ideas how healthcare students might see embedded in their curricula some of these concepts of vulnerability persistence, and she I lovingly says, the soothing strength found in collaboration. Hmm. Um, well, I think you guys, even on this committee that's put this series together are, are demonstrating some of that, right? Is sort of, is kind of breaking down those barriers and sort of saying, we really need one another um, and collaborating across, uh, across professionals, professions across disciplines is, is really, um, really critical. And, um, you know, how, how do we do that? I mean, I mean, I think starting to accept ourselves is a big part of what we have to do and saying that I don't actually have to know everything and I don't have to be everything. And I can't do what I need to do in my work in this, in, whether it's in clinical work or research or education that I, we actually really need each other. So, um, I think that that's, you know, that's definitely part of, of what it's going to take is um, they're going from that spirit of fierce individualism and, you know, I am the mighty doctor who has all the answers to sort of saying, actually, you know what, nobody has all the answers. We need to, we really, really depend on one another to be able to successfully do uh, what's necessary. And that's okay for for somebody to say that they need someone, it doesn't actually make you less of a successful physician or nurse or anything else by saying that actually, um, I can't, I can't actually solve all these problems all on my own. So um, I think, as I say, this, this series hopefully will do that. Um, and also just giving each other the, the strength to say it's okay not to, not to know everything. It's so great for us to be in a place that we are able to even say these things when many years ago we wouldn't say the same things out loud because someone might think we were weak, but yet to really acknowledge that we're human, which is really refreshing. So we're going to keep going because uh, Jessica Trier has a question. She thanks you for sharing your story uh, and says that it's inspiring to see a lady demonstrate such vulnerability and candor. And she also appreciates that you reflected on your privilege. Her question is, can you tell us more about the support networks that you relied on when you were going through these detours? Hmm. Oh, interesting. Um, I mean, for many of us, family is our biggest support network, right? When, when possible, they're, you know, not everybody can, can depend on their family, but if you can, obviously they are fantastic. Um, I guess I'll give two things. One was, um, and maybe Damon, I think he and I talked a bit, bit about this. In the political crisis that I faced, I, and I didn't say this in my talk, but actually what I went through with losing my daughter actually really helped me prepare for that political crisis because I'd already had the worst thing in the world happen to me, right? To me that the, I don't know, you guys can debate it if you want. I think losing your child is about the worst. Most people who have children, it's your kind of worst nightmare. And I remember thinking very much, you know, over the, the nasty stuff that was happening in that political thing. Um, 
was like people really did say horrible <laughs> things to me. I really learned how to use my mute button on on Twitter. Um, but honestly, the 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 resilience that you build up from realizing I actually somehow I don't know how it happened. I somehow survived the worst thing that could possibly happen. And so you can't hurt me any more than that, right? If you're not, you know, you you can take away my my role in the party you can take away you could say hor the worst things about me um but nobody died and uh so i think that was sort of that strength of the family saying you know what we're still together we still love you um nobody's going to take my relationships away from me and not all of us have a lot of relationships, but if you have one or two people in the world who you know love you no matter what, and no matter what other people say about you, you know that those people will be there for you. Often, you know, that's what you have to cling to. And for me, that was really, was really helpful. So definitely family and a few dear friends and you, you do start to realize um, who they are and how much they mean to you. There, sorry, there are a couple of questions uh, from uh, Bria. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, the questions are, how do you personally foster vulnerability within medicine or professional circles broadly um, in your various capacities? Uh, and has your perspective towards planning for the unknown changed since your detours? Okay, these are hard questions you guys are asking. <laughs> I can all exam. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so let me maybe take the second one first in terms of planning for the unknown. Um, I'm pretty sure that going through those things do, did has helped me to prepare for the unknown. I mean, I think life to a certain extent does that to you as you start to realize that, uh, you know, the best laid plans of mice and people, um, you know, are, are not to be counted upon. And so the more it happens to you, the more you realize that um, we can always have a plan or a vision a little ways out um, and some, some core principles of what you're aiming for, but the way of getting there might change along the way and you need to be continuously iterating and adapting. Um, but let me just, I'm trying to look for that question here to read the first part. How do you personally foster vulnerability within? Uh, okay, so I'm, um, I'm not sure, if, completely sure of the answer to that, but I think what uh, it comes to is um, getting the big pieces right about, uh, it comes down to just what I talked about earlier is that realizing that we're human beings, that we are going to make mistakes um, and that, um, you know, making a mistake is not the worst thing in the world or making or having, you know, roadblocks along the way is not the worst thing in the world. As long as you're willing to, you know, self-reflect, learn from your mistakes, figure out how to do better the next time. And that we really cut each other a bit of slack, I think. That we have very, very high standards for one another, but we really recognize that nobody's perfect. And I'm not gonna toss you out as a person or as a colleague um, if, you've, if, you've, if you uh, stumble once in a while. Um, and finding ways to sort of, um, foster that safe ability to say either I'm struggling personally or I, uh, I made a mistake professionally and create a space where we're going to allow each other to be imperfect from time to time. Well, we'll, we're, we'll be imperfect always, but that we will actually um, make mistakes and finding ways that we can kind of safely have those conversations together um, to to say, actually, I, you know, if possible, the person who, who made the mistake kind of can, can be the first one to speak up about it. Or if not, if you see a colleague making a mistake, it will create a safe place for you to go to a colleague and say, I actually think, um, you know, this, that you did something wrong here, but not putting a person's entire value on the fact that they might have uh, messed up or that things might not have gone as perfectly as possible. Lots of forgiveness, 
lots of kind of thinking the best of others, even though they, they're going to be fallible and they're going to stumble along the way. Um, and then kind of wishing to figure out how we can prop those people up and get them back on their way. That um, reminder of thinking the best of others is really important because that's an easy one to fall down on. So um, I do love when you remind me of that. And I also think that that element of I got your back, even if you screw up, it's okay. It it because I think we all I hope we all have each other's backs in order to get through the various detours. We're going to have one last question, and it's from Peter O'Neill, who thanks you for sharing your path in a time of fake news, industry-driven medical research, and staggering student debt, and asks, how do we select students who have a sense of service? Mm, what a great question, Peter. Um, I don't know that we know that entirely, but I think that's something that we should really ask together um, more effectively. You know, our and um, I've had some really good conversations with Tony about this. Hopefully, Tony's not listening today because he's supposed to be kind of taking a little breather. But <laughs> but he and I, you know, he's obviously been involved in in medical education for a very long time and has done a lot of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, he and I have sort of said. Uh, in the world of medical education, it's been a long time since there's been a, a real innovation around how we figure out who, who should be the doctors of the future in the way that, you know, a generation or more ago, McMaster sort of revolutionized their approach to admissions and, 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 and finding better ways to be able to identify who are the best people. I think we're possibly on the verge of needing to refresh that and to do that maybe in an interprofessional way might be really interesting because we need people that are really smart, but out of the you know 5,000 people that applied for medical school this year, probably 4,800 of them are have the you know intellectual capacity to to succeed so how do you actually sort out amongst that 4,800 not the people who will just have the intellectual and technical capacity but who will actually have the right motivations to 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 you know to look to the big issues around population health and equity and all of those kinds of things uh, I don't think we really have those tools to the extent that we ought to and I I will confess to having not reflected as deeply on this from the point of view of rehabilitation therapy or nursing, but I suspect that similar issues lie there around trying to figure out who are the right people that, that have come to this career for the right reasons. Um, I think that's something that this is a table or a conversation, and I'm really glad that you've got people like Dr. Wiley and other community members who are part of the conversation, because I actually think that's something the community needs to decide, not people within health professions, um, to sort of go to community to say, what kind of person do you want to be caring for you when you're in your time that you're sickest? Yes, you want someone who's super duper well-trained and competent from a medical or clinical skills point of view, but you also want them to have a whole bunch of other properties or, or qualities as well. Um, and and uh, I think we probably are due for a bit of a refresh on how we, how we um, make those decisions. So not something to solve tonight at 6.01 when you're all wanting to get on with your evening. Um, so I, I'm gonna bring us home, uh, Jane and, and everyone else. Um, you know, this is our third session of the Humanity and Healthcare series. And um, what we were hoping has happened, uh, yeah, our Dean of Faculty of Health Sciences role modeling um, vulnerability, uh, meaning, you know, trying to be a force for meaningful change through storytelling, shared vulnerability, um, and, and through creating a safe space together and having a conversation. So, um, you know, thank you, Jane, so much. Thanks to everybody for coming. And, you know, we can't, um, I can't leave without picking up on one last comment question from uh, and I hope I pronounce Susan's name properly, Susan Broly, who asks, you know, these conversations that we're trying to have together within Faculty of Health Sciences and, and you as our Dean, along with the, the decanal leadership and other leaders, I, I think Susan's question is, is really, you know, how can we have more of an influence uh, on the university and creating 
spaces and priorities like we're talking about tonight more broadly within the Queen's University community. That's not to say that they're not already going on, but uh, let me just go up to Susan's uh, comment and question here after her thank you. Her question is, how can you and us evoke these changes with those in leadership positions across campus? Um, and so I, you know, not, not to say that we have all the answers, certainly we, we absolutely do not, uh, we're imperfect too. Um, and Jane, I, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on that or just let that sort of si simmer and, until the next time we get together. I think these, my sense is that these changes and conversations are happening. Um, you know, I think uh, if you haven't already had a chance to read the principal's report on the conversation, it's really worth a read. Um, and um, I, I think uh, I think he's really set a good tone for the, these kinds of conversations for us. And there's a, a good spirit of, there's always, there are always challenges in terms of what it takes to run a university in, in these times. But um, um, I, I would encourage, provide the encouragement that my sense is that at the central university level that these conversations are, are quite active. So um, it, it, the, our next phase of our challenge then is to think, how do you go even broader than that to the sort of the community and beyond? Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank, thank you, Jane, for everybody that's here before we go. Um, Hugh Wiley, one of our uh, humanity and healthcare advisory team members is going to be presenting on Wednesday, February 10th from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, with uh, probably uh, one of the healthcare professionals that he has established a, a therapeutic uh, alliance and relationship with um, and to speak about um, a personal story um, of a significant injury that has changed his life and, and speak to uh, relationship and, and some of the uh, the detours in his his life from his own personal injury. Um, so hopefully many of you can uh, come to that. Uh, and in the meantime, everybody, please stay safe, stay healthy, please be vigilant um, and remind others to be vigilant. And uh, hopefully everybody uh, come February 10th, um, uh, them and their families and everybody um, will have had a safe, period between now now and then uh, on behalf of the of the team uh, thanks for coming and uh, it was a wonderful hour together <laughs>